what really strikes me um, is, is the emphasis on mutuality. Um, I think that as you observe, there are lots of these calls going on. And I've thought a lot about how the invitation to dialogue is sometimes um, a covert way to just have a conversation where you can see that I'm right. <laughs> and a real culture of encounter, I think, is this recognition that we are shaping and being shaped by other people. So I was thinking about how when I was in high school, I was trained in um, sort of championship policy debate and how do you make your point effectively? How do you move people through the power of rhetoric? And that builds on this kind of older tradition of you can win friends and influence people as a way of encounter. But I think that if we're really thinking seriously about dialogue, that comes with this wisdom of um, mutual adaptation and, and the ability to be as willing to be changed while also coming from a place of clear conviction. And that to me really also impacts who we invite into the dialogue, who's even in the room, who, who is part of the dialogue. Um, so I'm really, I'm really struck by um, Pope Francis is framing that no one is useless and no one is expendable. I've been doing a lot of thinking and teaching around disability justice lately and this really profound conviction that I think comes to us most strongly from the disability justice movement that everybody's in and nobody's out. Nobody is disposable. And that feels like the difference um, than this culture of, of waste or disposability and just figuring out how to exclude people as a way of driving forward our agenda. But I'm, I'm really struck by the framing of the culture of encounter by how inclusive it is and that recognition that, um, that sometimes the voices we least want to hear, <laughs> it isn't as convenient to exclude those voices. It certainly isn't the right thing to do. Um, it's not the expedient thing to do but also that is really the space in which we, we reach a deeper um, sense of understanding. And I think at this time when the world is becoming so much more polarized, and people are simply encountering each other less <laughs> by choice, we really have to be intentional about cultivating um, and tending this, this deeper culture of encounter. I just think on a really day-to-day -day level, I, um, I'm in the classroom all of the time. And I think that the way that we are taught to think about what a professor looks like and sounds like is as a sort of beacon of power and control. <laughs> and what I've learned over time is that the best moments in the classroom come when I am as open to um, meeting the students where they are and being changed by them. And some of the, the best teachers in my life at this point have also been my students. Now that still does mean thinking seriously about power. It would be very, I think, um, blithe of me to pretend like there isn't a big power difference between us. But I, I do think that that idea of um, being present to each other, especially in this moment when we are, we're present through the Zoom room. <laughs> and I think coming and thinking about what will it mean to continue to nurture a culture of encounter for my students and for me when we are physically separate. And what struck me very early on is how much humanity still comes through um, when you are present to each other over Zoom. So we have people's, you know, younger siblings in the frame with us and we have pets and people's um, I'm sorry, my um, Wi-Fi has, has jiggled a little bit. Um, we still have this like encounter of people coming in and out of, of the room. And so that moment of thinking about culture of encounter while being remote has shaped my thinking in some ways about what it means to be present to each other. And also the justice issues around that, to be honest. I think part of um, the culture of encounter also has to do with dealing gently with one another. And I'm thinking even as you and I are connecting via Zoom, there are technologies of extraction behind the, the laptop that I'm using to connect. So even while we can be building connections, 
This has a carbon footprint. Um, this is implicated in who has access and who doesn't and what the politics of extraction are. And so I think even when we're thinking about person to person uh, encounters, I'm also holding that tensor, tension of how this is situated institutionally and, and actually ecologically. So I, I also think what the culture of encounter has come to mean to me is recognizing that it costs people different things to be even in the room. That, that depending on the situation you're coming from, the conversation lands in our bodies and in our lives in different ways. Um, I started researching interfaith dialogue as first as an undergraduate student where I was helping create an interfaith dialogue um, organization at my undergraduate institution. And then as a master's student, I co-wrote a book about interfaith dialogue in the Middle East. And what I have reflected on over time is how much um, my relative stability and privilege in the world meant that I was coming to that dialogue based solely in curiosity, to be honest. It, it was somewhat easier for me to feel open and curious about encountering difference because what was on the line for me was not high stakes. So when I'm framing this, like what the culture of encounter means to me and, and thinking about the technology of it and the institutionality of it, I'm also thinking about how even as we're encountering each other, um, the stakes of that encounter may feel really different for people, depending on what we're talking about and how implicated we are in that. So that's a thing that I think I can sort of track my change over time. I also, um, I think that when we're talking about encounter, we don't use the term conflict. <laughs> um, but a lot of the times we're not talking in the culture of encounter about people who already agree with each other. I think we're often talking about conflict. And I, uh, I think I've come over time to get more comfortable in conflict. If you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I think I would try to tell you how conflict can be avoided. And over time, both intellectually, the way that I've driven my own um, program of, at the university, but also thinking about conflict in my own life has shifted much more from how do we prevent conflict to Conflict is inevitable and conflicts can be transformative. So really what we're asking is, how do we not harm each other? Um, how, do we, how do we engage in conflict in a way that minimizes harm and, um, and is as removed from violence as possible? And that also means making room for error, <laughs> our, including our own error, um, the ability to change our minds. I think I'm in a profession that uh, often thinks that changing your mind is an indication that you're really wrong. <laughs> but I am trying to practice and create an ethos around sharing failures and moving away from this brittleness of perfection, that if we don't get it 100% right all of the time, we might as well not say anything at all. But that really requires um, a practice of vulnerability and also um, being willing to not only extend that grace to myself, but also if I am nervous about not getting things perfect, I have to be open and merciful of the fact that the person I most disagree with might also be stumbling a little bit in the way they present it, or they also have to have space to change their mind over time. And, and offering that grace to ourselves is so much easier than it is um, to, to offer that grace to other people. So I think those are some of the ways that I've um, evolved and also um, been changed a little bit in the way that I even think about what encounter means in my own life and in my own work. The Commission on International Affairs in the World Council of Churches, um, I have facilitation responsibility, co-responsibility for that space. And we have a committee of 35 different people from all over the world, different faith traditions, um, speaking different languages as their first language. Um, and we operate by consensus, um, which is a, um, one of the most challenging and also generative aspects of our work together. 
And it has taught me so much about how to hold the space um, and how to hold the space for conflict. So um, when we are thinking, some of this thinking about how do we offer generosity to each other, um, I think some of how that work is built at, is also having the informal encounters of shared meals and, and taking a, a walk after dinner together and taking tea together. These ways of getting to know um, that somebody has had a new grandchild and they're showing us pictures on their phone or um, that somebody is um, got great tomatoes blooming in their garden. Like these ways of, of building a life together, even while we are aware that we are, we're working together and we will sometimes be in conflict in the room and then have tea together. And there's a natural inclination to continue that conversation. And from a facilitation standpoint, sometimes that's really good. Sometimes the, the performativity of um, difference in the room behind the microphone melts a little bit when we're um, you know, balancing tea and <laughs> standing, standing around together. So sometimes that's good. But I've also thought a lot about the value of breaks um, coming from a North American context. And I think also acknowledging the ways that my own whiteness plays a role in this. I come from a culture um, that is, is faster talking. Um, I, I am an extrovert by nature. And so I can verbally process things on the go. And I have grown up and been nurtured in a culture that values efficiency. And consensus-based decision-making is one of the least efficient ways you can do things. So I am always in, in touch with my inner um, strategist that would love to like maneuver through this or come with an idea of how this can work and present it to them. And if they just buy into this idea, we can move forward with the conversation. But what I have really learned over time is how much nurturing the space for difference can involve taking a pause, however fast I'm going, um, slowing it down, <laughs> going at um, half the speed, taking a breath together with people of faith. I think actually pausing for a moment, uh, a prayerful kind of presence, um, I've seen some facilitators do a song quickly, like what if we take a moment and actually engage in this artistic side, um, but really like building a culture where we create a norm of not just coming prepared with your statement to, to wow everyone with and hoping that people will be impressed by the shiny polish of your ideas, because in that room, people are operating in a second or third language. Um, someone is always jet lagged. We move the meeting around the world so that we're also really in touch with frontline communities in whatever issue we're discussing. But we have to have this kind of grace with each other that what is at stake here, as I was saying earlier, can be really different. And our ways of responding to conflict look really different. So we, I think, are often taught in, um, I guess I'll just speak for myself. I was really taught growing up in um, rural Midwestern Michigan that when people raise their voice, that means they're angry and anger is bad. <laughs> but operating cross-culturally, um, not every time someone um, raises the volume or um, raises the like the amount of gesturing, that doesn't mean we're in a danger zone. It means that we're like, we maybe are right in the real, the meat of the matter um, that we can acknowledge like, oh, this has power. But it also just might be the, the way that somebody engages with this. But by the same token, um, the quiet withdrawnness might also be a sign of disagreement. And so, uh, I really had to think a lot about how we indicate um, where we are to each other and not always tend the loudest <laughs> voice in the room or assume that the person who seems the most unhappy is actually going to block consensus because sometimes not, that's not the case. And so continuing to kind of hold the energy of the room, keeping people moving forward and as much as I can letting go of my own agenda. Um, sometimes I really need to think of a process where 
I say the thing that I want to say on this issue to a friend at some other time, um, write a really um, clearly worded speech in my daily reflection notebook, write a 10 minute play about it because the best work that I can do as a facilitator is often to hold that space and try to be as wholly on the side of whoever is talking and balance that kind of introversion, extroversion, cultural differences. Um, how do we need a break because at this person's biological clock is ticking at 2 a.m. right now. And so to ask them to speak quickly on the issue <laughs> at hand, just it's not fair. And how do we keep, um, keep moving together and from a facilitation point, I think I need to project hopefulness that we can do this um, and do a little bit of the kind of um, effusive enthusiasm that we can we can create someplace. The journey is made by our walking of it and we are walking it. Um, and just because we're not there yet doesn't mean we're failing somehow or we're not dealing authentically or in, in good faith with this issue. But I mean, again, I think it's it's easier in some ways doing this with people of faith because you can use this language that I have to code switch out of in the classroom around like, can we be present to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us? Um, that's not something I'm gonna say in a classroom in a secular <laughs> setting where I teach. That being with people of faith, I think there are these kind of shared ways of like, we are not the only participants in this. There is the, the communion of saints and the, the ancestors that we have been formed by. And there is a shared sense of the divine. Like what, what does God trying to say without pretending that any of us is speaking for God? <laughs> Um, and to sometimes shift people off of that by saying like, it's so easy to think like, you are about to hear what God has put in my heart to share. What if the way we need to think is that God has something to say to us and it's being spoken by the person I'm finding most difficult? <laughs> what, what do we do with that then? Um, I think that's one, of, that's one of the challenges. two things um, really stand out uh, for me. And one is actually forefronting the role of artists and um, bringing artists into the core of the ways we think about policy issues, um, not treating the arts only as a source of entertainment, but how in the in the experience of the arts are we learning to encounter the other and and hear the humanity of, of people. So I'm uh, I'm also a playwright, and I think a lot about good playwriting and how um, telling someone's story. A good play means that there is never a villain that is just all bad. You you always have to be thinking why is this character who's the antagonist also making choices that pursue their own agenda, and that that thinking around the architecture of a story and of character building has actually really influenced the way that I see policy making. Um, because when I imagine then and to shift to sort of the nuclear disarmament um, world, I feel with every core of my being that nuclear weapons are immoral <laughs> and they violate every single principle about who we say we are, certainly as people of faith, but actually just fundamentally as human beings. And so when I encounter the need to dialogue with people who are um, who find security in nuclear weapons, it is so hard for me to get anywhere except you are a dealer in death. <laughs> but no one is waking up in the morning and telling that story about themselves. Nobody is the villain of their own story. And so I really then have the choice in nuclear disarmament work to think about tactically, how do we move people? Um, is it through um, a whole range of, of very time honored tactics around nonviolence? Um, I mean, nonviolence has this really profound debate about do our tactics convince our opponent? And so change is made because your opponent sees your fundamental humanity really is swayed by the power of your arguments. 
or do you actually use nonviolent coercion? You in, engage in um, different kinds of tactical actions that are based in nonviolence, but also change your opponent's behavior. So the idea that maybe my opponent will never agree with me that nuclear weapons are abhorrent, but maybe they will stop funding them. <laughs> maybe they will um, stop threatening to use them. Or maybe I will make it so costly for banks that invest in nuclear weapons that they haven't changed their moral opinion on nuclear weapons, but they see that this is a bad investment and remove money. So I think we're always thinking about like um, whether we convince uh, or use these tactics to change the behavior, regardless of whether your opponent changes their mind or not. And I am I'm equally fascinated by both of those streams of thinking. I'm part of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And we've thought a lot about international law and how building a new norm actually can push nation states to engage in victim assistance and environmental remediation, can pull money away from um, producing nuclear weapons. So there, there's that kind of work. And then I'm also part of faith communities that have said um, nuclear weapons are a sin. We can put this in our own language. It's not just that they're a bad idea. <laughs> they're actually a sin. They violate our humanity. And from the perspective of um, from faith communities, I think uh, Pope Francis has been so powerful in, in adding to that moral voice around nuclear weapons. But I think we have to keep building, um, building this project both ways, continuing this kind of framework of actions, but also continuing to think about how understanding where people's sense of security comes from. And so I can... Um, work for the divestment um, around nuclear technologies and I can um, you know even engage in kind of street activism around keeping nuclear weapons part of the conversation but at some point I think I also have to ask these questions about when people say they feel feel so fearful that they need a weapon that can um, carelessly obliterate millions of people that they'll never meet. That is a really core fear. And I, at some point, I'm going to have to address that fear. Because otherwise, I am going to go and shift from um, banning chemical weapons, banning biological weapons, banning nuclear weapons. But if that core fear still exists, um, then, then I haven't actually addressed what is driving some of this technology. I can continue to work on these campaigns um, to limit the harm, and I think we should do that. But there is also this deeper piece around trying to understand where is that fearfulness coming from? And that does bring me back to art. How do we take seriously the story of the person who feels okay going to work every day and um, theoretically discussing the destruction that a nuclear weapon can, can inflict because that person exists. That is someone's job to, to kind of game this out. And there's something in their story that has made them think that that's acceptable. And I think if we're really gonna make this profound change, I have to think, I have to understand what that story is and try to address that person's very real fears in a way that also um, ensure a safety for, for everyone else.